Calling this meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council informational meeting to order Tuesday, October 6, 2015. Uh, first item on the agenda today will be City Council open discussion. Do we have any items for open discussion today? Councilman Rolfing. Just want to welcome uh, Councilman Staggers back from a little hiatus and uh, welcome back to your rightful place. And elsewhere, that's for sure. So, yes, appreciate it. Any other items for open discussion? Some gifts, too, huh? Oh, yes, sir. That's, that's nice. <laughs> Councilman Karski. I, one of the things I did last week, I uh, went to Discovery Elementary School and I was able to speak to six um, classes of third graders. There are about 120 third graders that are learning all about city government and they had their own elections and somebody got to be mayor and city council and I, I have to tell you that these third graders were way ahead of anything I ever did in third grade and their knowledge of city government and their interest in city government. So just a hats off to uh, those third graders at Discovery Elementary. I did receive about six different letters that they composed um, looking for additions to bike trails and um, parks and stuff in their neighborhood, even water fountains in their neighborhood. So I'll be looking at that and responding to them, but they're very involved third graders at Discovery Elementary. So. Any other items for open discussion at this time? Councilman Jamison. Uh, last Thursday at the uh, Seacock building, we had our regional planning meeting. We, uh, we didn't have very good attendance. I think there were some challenges due to the uh, changing of the venue or times and things. So, But for uh, Councilor Anderson, myself, and Councilor Erpenbach, we were there and, uh, and the Lincoln County, Minnehaha County representatives were there. And it was determined that we would have another meeting and reschedule it where more of us could be there and participate. We uh, reviewed the projects that we would had gone through before and found that it was useful and productive and people enjoyed it and wanted to continue it. And uh, look for those uh, new meeting dates to get scheduled. Have you looked at your email this afternoon? I believe that uh, they did send a one for a building committee. I believe it's next Monday at 11. I'll look right now, but that's great. Uh, what there, if you wanted to, you could add maybe the items that we did, we were gonna continue discussing if you wanted to bring that up while I look at these. Do you remember? Excuse we had me? We had two items that came out, just real briefly. Um, two items that we wanted to continue discussing. One is the uh, re related to the jail and uh, but there's also other pieces of the jail discussion regarding uh, judicial matters. So when the police department arrests people, there are ways that we can help try to maybe prevent them from ever going to jail by changing state law or city ordinances. That would help maybe reduce some of the burden on the jail. Other things connected to the jail other than just building the building. The other part was uh, the shared resources of, uh, of actual buildings. Uh, I think it was Dale Long from uh, Lincoln County brought up the fact that if we really wanted to show that we're all working together, we would have a joint building where we could, uh, people in Lincoln County could go and get their license plates. And um, so I think the whole group saw that as a valuable uh, opportunity to work, get, work together better. So those two items will be reviewed and further as we get together. I don't know if I'm missing any, and Dave Bixler and Jim David were there. If they had anything else they would like to add. Well, I, I was going to interject here, too. I think that uh, one of the items was going to be uh, a further discussion about their parking needs over there. As they build the new jail, they're going to be eliminating a large amount of surface parking. And the need for parking over there and how they want to accommodate the judicial system also as far as uh, with uh, making sure there's enough parking and that parking's convenient for people who are uh, <coughs> serving uh, during those times of trials and that to uh, be able to get in and out of the building and to their vehicles easy. Jim? 
Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, there was two items that came out of that group, and there is the existing jail discussion, the jail building committee, and I think, Councilor Anderson, you did reference that. It, that is independent of the group. That's a county group that is October 19th at 11 o'clock in the county administration building. I think from that meeting, two items had come out. Mental health <laughs> was brought up as one of them, and then the, um, the second item was the joint uh, government buildings, uh, plural not one building, but buildings. And so those were the two topics. The first topic that would be discussed is those joint buildings. And then later on, the, uh, the mental health would be discussed, so. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any other items for open discussion? Councilman Jamison. Just a heads up that we have a fiscal committee, fiscal committee meeting starting right after this. I think there might be an executive session. There will be an executive session first. So Following the executive session, we have a, uh, a fiscal committee meeting and the discussion there is really some new supplemental uh, information uh, reports from uh, Dave Bixler, our budget analyst, just to try to help summarize the, the monthly uh, budget review uh, information we get from uh, the city finance department. But there's always a review to try to see what else we could be <coughs> providing to counselors that they see as a tool so we're going to just review those items. Okay, thank you. Any other items for open discussion at this time? Seeing none, we'll move to presentations. Uh, first presentation that we have on the agenda is the USD Discovery District Master Plan and Update. And I believe Rich Nazer will be the presentator on this to start with. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Anderson and council members for this opportunity just to update you on the USD Discovery District Master Plan and our latest activities. And I'd be remiss if I didn't start by saying thank you for your support of the Discovery District in the upcoming budget year. We appreciate it very much. And uh, today is really an informational session. We are going through the city's planning and zoning process and our initial development plan, I believe, goes to the Planning Commission this week, Wednesday. And we've had a great experience working with city planning and engineering and streets and everyone on this process. But just wanted to make sure everybody was comfortable with uh, what we're bringing forward and what's behind the design of the USD Discovery District. So today I have uh, with me Kevin Bacon. Uh, with uh, Perkins and Will, who is involved in our master planning team. That was Arc Inc., Perkins and Will, uh, Sayer, and Confluence. And I've asked him to give an overview of uh, how we got to the point in the master plan and the thinking behind that. And then I'll give a brief update on, on where we're at on development of infrastructure and first facilities. So I'm going to introduce uh, Kevin Bacon. Good afternoon, and thank you, Council, for meeting with us today. Uh, I think it's been a little over a year since our last trip out here and maybe about mm, 10 months or so since we finished the master plan. So like Rich was mentioning, um, now that a lot of things are actually starting to get put into the ground, this is, uh, I think, a really great time to just have a quick refresher about what the master plan was about or is about. And so as you start to see these things come through, um, we all kind of remember what these, the, the goal of this project was. Uh, and so to kind of touch on this too, um, talking about really what's behind the master plan and really about research parks working on the one here in Sioux Falls as well as the ones uh, that we generally work on nationally, internationally, is it's always about economic development. There are a lot of plannerly terms you'll see us put into these and, and talking about integrated places, but really at, at the, the core of all of these, it has to be about economic development and ultimately jobs uh, to make these things successful. And so the vision and goals for the master plan have all been crafted to reflect that, um, particularly here in Sioux Falls where you have the University of South Dakota, um, really the driving force behind uh, the Discovery District and, and making sure that we understand what the university brings to the table, um, a lot of great things and leveraging those assets to make the park successful. And then ultimately about supporting the growth of the private sector within the company and the research efforts that they're undertaking. Um, the goals all build upon that, um, and again, I think the, the most, one of the more important ones being number four about creating the physical infrastructure necessary to make the park successful, and that's, that's a lot about what the master plan puts in place. And so what we do as master planners, um, when we're looking at these, is, is organizing the site to be flexible and to be positioned um, for any number of future scenarios, and really it's about putting the right things in the right place. In order to do that, 
for us, the way our process works is we really think about research parks, whether it's the Discovery District or other parks or districts that we're working on, um, is, is really the, there's four shared qualities of success that we see in these places. Uh, the first, that they're multidimensional, and so they're not just about the research. That's, that's the core being or the core reason for these things, but there have to be these supporting activities. And it's, it's not just a, a trend that we're seeing. It's, it's things that researchers are looking for and ultimately make them successful. Uh, we get asked about retail, and certainly that might be one aspect of it. But it's, it's, it's really those, those amenity spaces and supporting, user, supporting uses that allow research to happen. Um, interconnected, that these, these parks internally um, are, are not just a disparate set of pieces, but from building to building, from public space to public space, that that's all been, been thought of as one cohesive element. Um, collaborative, we're looking for spaces not just within classrooms or labs, um, but also externally in which uh, facilitate interactions between researchers and users of the park. And that integrated. These things aren't just you know, isolated uh, entities that exist outside of the city, but are very much integrated in the places that they, they uh, are, are located within. And some places that's easier than others. Certainly here in Sioux Falls, it's a little more challenging because we're farther outside of the city, but it's something that the master plan focused on to find opportunities for that and capitalize on those. Um, the context for this, uh, I think everybody's aware of where the, the research park currently exists. Um, and, and also just kind of understanding its relationship, not just to the University of South Dakota, but other major universities. So it's really at the, the center of, of, of all the major institutions. Um, also access to downtown, uh, it's, it's fairly close. Um, also having the regional airport nearby is, is a huge asset to this. Um, and then understanding everything that's in place surrounding the research park, other things that aren't just within the research park, but are, are, are assets that the, how we understand that this can integrate within the city. And then also understanding the internal logic of these parks themselves. Um, you know, it's, it's not just about laying out the streets, but understanding why the streets go a certain way and, and how we're organizing this thing so that in the future, um, it, it's really being flexible in a way that they can accommodate changes in, in you know, the, the use program, market conditions. Um, if there's anything that we've learned in the last seven years is, is we don't know for certain what's going to happen in, in six months, let alone seven years. So the one thing that is always in the forefront of our mind is when we're organizing these places is how can we respond to different conditions on the ground. And, and so understanding research parks, in this case the Discovery District, it's not all that different from what makes great cities and how cities have over, has changed over time. And so looking at um, you know, a typical block structure here in Sioux Falls, uh, 400 by 350 feet, um, how many different ways, how many different iterations this has undergone over the years. And so starting to think about the research park of, of how do we organize it internally in order to, to, to capture that, that kind of same flexibility. And so we start to look at this from the research in the lab building as the kind of the, the central model of which this might get developed and understanding that these buildings that researchers need have a, have a core uh, dimensional um, uh, characteristic to those. And so how are we organizing the, the structure of the park internally to accommodate um, any number of these configurations? And so the master plan itself, um, again, we, we've touched on all of these, that we're looking at the existing assets and integrating uh, mixing uses and embedding flexibility. Um, and, and so we come a, across with not just a, a vision for the 80-acre discovery district as it's defined uh, by this boundary, but looking at the university center overall to understand that we're integrating not just with the, the city, but also with the entire university center for one cohesive place. Um, and so the way that we think about that first and foremost are, are how the streets and the infrastructure are laid out, how we organize this internally to allow that flexibility. The streets are, and the infrastructure are more permanent and least likely to change. So those are the, the first elements that we think about in organizing this as a, an object of permanence. And then also the quality of those streets. What kind of public spaces are we creating as a place that's, that, that you know, accommodates automobiles but is also open for biking and walking and gives people those options thinking about where we want to focus development. So rather than thinking about each individual building as an island, how do we, we focus different activities? Um, in this case, we're not really assigning program to it just yet, but thinking about where this activity would take place, what's the relationship to parking, and thinking about the character of, of that space. And then, of course, open space and parks, um, places where we're not going to build. Um, those are, are assets to the park as well as, as, as elements that allow us to connect outside as well and some images of how that might look. An aerial of, of the park overall is one connected thing internally and also integrated with the city. 
And then so talking about next steps, some of the things that you'll be seeing here in the next uh, few days and, and coming, uh, coming weeks. Um, the first one, I think Rich touched on it earlier, is, is really the only thing that will be asked for at this point is um, we've been looking at part of the way that we, we organize the streets is to think of them as a hierarchy, and so we've identified those as you know, the one that is the activity corridor, is the tier one, the primary street that gets the, the highest level of design and the, the, the most uh, mix of users of the street, and then it, it, it tears down from there. And here's an image of that street. And so one of the things that we found in going through this process is that the S2 zoning district, that the activity corridor and the tier one street is found in, um, does have a setback requirement. And so we've been working with uh, the city planning to identify ways that we can bring um, elements from the, the urban village district um, into um, this S2 for this project in order to accommodate that. So the only addition would be, or, or change would be taking out that, that setback to allow this kind of development to occur so that the buildings confront and generate the type of activity that we're looking for. And then Rich, I think you wanted to talk about the buildings. Hopefully I'll push the buttons right direction. So yeah, so we're going through the, the, the city approval process and hope to be through that basically in December of this year with the goal of starting our first construction of uh, road and utility infrastructure uh, April of 2016. And right now we're planning to build, if we can, uh, about 3,300 uh, linear feet of road. Uh, the, the majority of that being that type one street with the zero setback that's numbered one on the screen. And then some other uh, secondary streets to enable development uh, 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 between different blocks. We estimate that the construction will be about a million four to a million nine. We have a million dollars secured for that between uh, the next Forwards Who Falls program and the funds they're raising and a general fund appropriation. Uh, that USD has and are currently in the process of applying for an EDA grant uh, which could match up to 50% of that million dollars. So hopefully we'll be successful in that and that'll be, that'll take us through this first phase of uh, construction and we'll start that next spring. Um, I think last time I briefed several of you we had just completed a feasibility study for a first building. Uh, we partnered with the Governor's Office of Economic Development on that and actually broke the building into two phases and it told about 109,000 square feet with a focus of doing uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing production and then research space in that building. And initially when we went through that process we looked at two phases, one maybe being the production space first at 25,000 square feet and then a phase two at 84,000 square feet and uh, projected a total construction cost of about $30 million at that point. Uh, right now we are planning the first phase of the building with a 20,000 square foot footprint which could be two or three stories plus added on to. So it would be a minimum of 40,000 and or a little more. Uh, Multi-tenant building here you can see the plans uh, for one of our potential anchor tenants, the majority of that in that light blue lab and uh, research space. We actually carve out some space for uh, some sort of amenity, coffee shop, restaurant, something of that nature as well, a few, a few thousand square feet. Uh, but we're meeting with two, three companies this week to continue to develop plans for them to get to the point where we can enter in negotiations for uh, construction and leasing of the facility. But that timeline will be driven, just so you know, by uh, having tenants for the building. Uh, it's going to be developed by private developers. It isn't build it and they will come. So we'll have the majority of at least with some additional space for companies uh, to take yet after the initial building is built. But we'd love to be designing this winter and starting construction sometime next year on that as well. So uh, that's all I had. And it was this was really just for your information. But would be happy to answer any questions. And uh, we've got the, the master planning expert here. Uh, as far as the layout of the, the infrastructure and the development and just appreciate the opportunity to come before you and share where we're at. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the council? Councilman Jamison. Rich, I couldn't help but uh, hear the zero setback yep. uh, design of the, uh, could you go back to that slide or that? Uh, I, I certainly can. And it's, uh, this one, I'll go back to this one. Uh, and it would just be for that type one street. Just the, the type one street. So the street that is in the red there that we are looking at as our main street. So those will have 20 foot sidewalks, a significant amount of landscaping, but they're actually designed similar to what your downtown Phillips Avenue is. And the, the thought is that this will be where we would have 
some retail, some uh, uh, dining, coffee shops, things of that nature, really trying to create a, a downtown <coughs> urban type environment. That would be the only space that would have zero setbacks on it. Um, the rest would, would uh, as far as we can tell, comply with the existing zoning. I get the look, I get, I, uh, you, I can see the pictures yep. as, as I went back to the slide and it, I can go back further. Yep. Here we go, there you go. Yeah, I get the feel, but um, <coughs> you know, with that, I think there's a lot of challenges for downtown because of that with the snow removal, uh, just plowing snow, things like that, uh, that, you know, probably, are you aware of it and you're willing? Yes, and you know so we would be, uh, the, none of that has been completely solidified, but the plan would be that we would at a minimum be remo uh, responsible for snow removal on the zero setback street portions. So the city may come through and plow it and we'd be responsible for moving it, but it may end up that we're responsible for 100% of the type one streets for that. I believe the remainder of the streets would uh, work for the city's snow removal process. So it's really just uh, the type one that we're gonna have to um, do some sort of agreement to handle the snow removal. And Rich, maybe you said it, but tell me, is, what is the real main purpose for that zero is the look? Is it some uh, kind of a feel that you're it's after? It's to drive the interaction, I believe, and I could, I could defer to Kevin on that if he has something to. Yeah, on some of the other streets that we had, um, some of the setbacks were larger and, and kind of forced the buildings uh, away from the street. And so when we were trying to get kind of that downtown feel, it was it was kind of becoming problematic because of the, the scale and the density and the type of development we were getting. You know, we're not looking at six or eight story buildings. We'll, we'd all love that in some cases. Uh, most of these are gonna be two to three stories. So when we were looking at the width of the street and the setbacks, it was really pushing these things far apart. And so when we're looking at kind of creating these, these enclosed spaces that create those kind of conditions for collision that we see in other other cities, and you, you kind of see in your, your Main Street area here, um, it, it was kind of a, a challenge for us that we couldn't quite o overcome. And so getting rid of those setbacks and really allowing the buildings to come up to the street helped tighten up that, that public space element and create the conditions that are, are more favorable for the activities we want. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Rolfing. Yes, um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Councilor Erpenbeck thinks that some of this should be blue and gold. But um, it's, it's okay. That's okay. And We're I for sale. Too. I do too for, uh, for Augustana. I would encourage statewide unity on this, Mr. That's Rolfing. a good point, good point, <laughs> good point. <laughs> Secondly, um, any, uh, now she, yeah, anyway, uh, any uh, prospects yet for uh, people to rent these or to start their businesses in them? Yes, we have about 10 companies right now that we are in various stages of discussion with. Uh, some of them larger companies existing in South Dakota, some outside the state. Uh, Nobody is at a point where they're willing to sign a lease at this point yet uh, for the buildings, but we hope to get to that point in the next probably 90 to 120 days where we have somebody sign a letter of commitment and we're working on designing the building. So in the, almost all of those, although we haven't said this is exclusively a human health biotech uh, a research district. That's pretty much all the types of companies that we're talking to are companies that are involved in some sort of biomedical research or product development. And as a follow up, I, I do want to thank uh, President Abbott for being such a huge supporter of this for the, from the university. I think it's fantastic and, and uh, he's a driving force and we appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, and I would say that this still does not preclude us from working with the other state universities. In fact, one of the companies that is a prospect for the Discovery District, currently in the Technology Business Center, this week they're spending up at SDSU at the College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, working on a, 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 a prototype product development. So there's certainly gonna be interactions, but you're correct, USD has been the driving partner for this in the university system. Any other? Councilman Stagers. Yes, um, do you have any rough idea how many people will be in that area, yep. population? You know, well, we have a several hundred page traffic study, I think that'll show that. Uh, but no, uh, the projections for the 80 acres is about 2,800 people, oh, okay. uh, in addition to what's out there for, um, what is out there for uh, university students through University Center. Hmm. Councilman Karski. Thank you, two questions. Uh, first one, kind of easy, I guess. 
the, going back to the streets, you guys are going to build them. They're not going to be private. It's going to be pu public streets maintained by the city, correct? We, the, the intent at this point is for us to build them and dedicate the streets to the city. Okay, yes. so they will belong yep. to us. The second question, a little more involved, can you kind of explain the role of the University Center and of the Discovery District and how one feeds or plays upon the other and are there successes contingent upon each other? Can, can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, well, yes, the goal would be that they would feed, feed the success of each other. So one of the reasons that companies locate in a Discovery District or Research Park really is access to human capital. Uh, so right now, for example, USD's biomedical engineering program is offered up at University Center at the Gear Center, and that's really been a driver for us to interact with small startup uh, companies looking to utilize services, do research partnerships, and or to hire some of their students and graduates. Uh, over time, what we hope to see happen is that new programs, additional programs that would meet the needs of these companies to be offered at University Center as well. So from that side, the Discovery District hopefully will drive the success and growth and evolution of University Center. And on the other side, we need those programs to be developed and offered to continue to meet the, uh, glad that's not mine, uh, uh, to continue to meet the, uh, continue to meet the needs of the companies. Uh, also, that's, that's actually been a discussion with the Board of Regents because we are wrapping this development around uh, University Center, but the real hope is that uh, there'll be classes offered in different floors of these buildings up and down, especially this activity corridor. So if your students taking classes on the first floor or second floor, going to the other floors to do an internship or have their first job. I mean, that's the real idea is that these things are completely intermixed and you almost can't tell where one stops and the other begins. And uh, that's what we'd like to see. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Erickson. I just want to say thanks for the presentation. I know we've had many conversations and I think that this is such a unique um, opportunity for Sioux Falls and the surrounding age region. It offers um, a different type of education that isn't maybe um, here as much and we've lost people to go across the borders to get their education around the Nebraska area, et cetera, um, to other regions. And so I think that this is exciting for our community and the impact it can have is definitely long term. And um, I, I think it's great to see your vision unfold as we move forward. So thank you. I really appreciate that comment. I'll just share one little anecdote. So one of the things we're looking at doing is naming the streets after very successful uh, uh, university researchers and faculty uh, who have come out of uh, USD and other universities. And we have people who came through USD who first discovered the link of smoking and cancer, or uh, one Nobel Prize laureate, uh, E.O. Lawrence, uh, and a woman who worked for the FDA and, and stopped the approval of a drug that was causing birth defects all over the rest of the world. So we've had, to your point, we've had these people who came through South Dakota but had to leave to go on to their careers and have the successes and the challenges they were seeking. And that's really reflective of what we're trying to do here. So that's, that's our street naming nomenclature that we're working on right now is to lift that up and, and we have those great people that come from these places, so. Any other questions from the council? Rich, I'd like you to speak a little bit further to uh, some of the other amenities that are going to be, that you are looking at yep. uh, providing like the retail and the housing, things like yep. that. And it's, uh, and it, I will start off by saying that's all, and uh, Kevin can jump in anytime, <laughs> but all subservient to the research and science technology aspects. So, you know, we call out about another 10% of that space being classroom space, 9% being commercial and retail, and about a similar percent being hospitality, uh, which could be a hotel and or mixed, uh, mixed use uh, uh, office buildings and apartment buildings. But the idea is really to kind of create a version of what a downtown is, where the primary focus is science and technology research and business, but you have enough of those amenities there to create the uh, interactions and the collisions and, uh, and the valuable conversations that take place in a coffee shop that won't take place in an office building. Uh, but so it is very much a minor component of it comparatively, uh, but a key component. And also we will coordinate those things with you know, uh, needs of university center uh, they are, uh, the number one question I get asked by university center staff is when are we going to get a coffee shop uh, in proximity? And that's why we're actually building from university center out uh, instead of building, you know, three blocks in another direction, but is to create space that they can utilize as well. 
uh, but it's it's um, a key component, but it's not the main driving component for it. Yep. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, next item on the agenda would be downtown parking ramp update uh, by Darren Smith. Good afternoon, Darren Smith, Director of Community Development. Uh, before we leave the previous topic, I did just want to note that uh, South Dakota State University does in fact uh, have its own research park in Brookings, a very successful park. Uh, we were just there recently for a meeting uh, with, uh, with their board members, and so the USD Park can, can, uh, can learn from that. Uh, but of course, we're very excited that uh, USD, which sometimes is informally referred to as the Harvard of the Upper Midwest, oh. is interested in, in uh, having a research park in Sioux Falls. So I just, uh, so very excited for both schools. <laughs> okay, now the topic I'm really here for. Uh, the downtown project, and of course, it's more than just uh, it's more than just a parking ramp project. Uh, this will be a large uh, mixed-use project with private partners, private spaces, private uses, in addition to our parking ramp. And also, it's going to be a very complex uh, project. Uh, so we're on the front end of the project. There's uh, quite a bit to go here moving forward, and uh, we expect that today will be the first of quarterly updates to the city council where we'll come and give you a status report and of course there will be communications in between like one that I sent out recently via email uh, to this group. Real quick before we get into the slides I want to also uh, proactively introduce a couple other gentlemen that you'll hear from today. Uh, following me will be Dick Strasberg with the Tegra group. I think you're all familiar with Dick and uh, his work and the work of Tegra on some other city projects like the recently completed event center and also uh, the indoor aquatic center which is being constructed right now. Um, we have them involved in helping us with this project and he's going to talk about uh, very briefly about uh, some of the design and construction components uh, and efforts that will be associated with this project and he'll also be back tonight uh, to address the item on your agenda related to the, uh, the resolution for the construction manager at risk approach for this project and he's going to talk about that a little bit today too. And then lastly will be Dustin Powers. Uh, Dustin's an economic development coordinator in the community development office. Uh, again, I think you're all familiar with Dustin's recent work on the 2025 downtown plan. Uh, he managed that effort, did a great job, and so he's being rewarded by managing uh, this complex uh, long project as well. And he'll do a great job and he'll wrap things up today. Um, the uh, approach with this project, uh, we've been really looking towards the future uh, at the time for this project for a few years now really uh, with the parking system, seeing uh, the activity downtown, downtown development, everything going on downtown and uh, that has also coincided with more and more of the capacity of our public parking system being utilized which means fewer and fewer spaces available uh, for new development and for the public. Uh, so again, we've been looking forward with great anticipation for this day to come to move forward with this project and, and that day came uh, really uh, earlier this year or even as much as a year ago when we knew where we were in the parking system in terms of how full we were and what those trends were that we needed to go forward with this, with this effort. But we didn't want to build, again, just another kind of generic cookie cutter parking ramp like we've done in the past and that's fine. We felt like we could move forward uh, with a project like the one that's proposed, the one that we are moving forward with, because downtown Sioux Falls uh, is really ready for that. The market is there to support it. Uh, we felt strongly about that. So we moved forward with an RFP, a request for proposals, um, earlier this year in the spring. And we had three proposals submitted, all very good proposals. They were evaluated by a committee, very good evaluation committee, very diverse, uh, included uh, Council Member Erickson, a private citizen, downtown Sioux Falls uh, folks, city staff and so forth from multiple departments actually. And we selected a proposal that has that was named and has been referred to as the banks. Um, and so again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, but it was a perfect fit for what we were looking for and hoping for. Um, 
uh, what we're looking at is a city funded parking ramp, uh, privately funded and constructed hotel with retail space. The hotel as proposed has about 80 rooms, uh, be a boutique style hotel. So, you know, again, very unique, unlike a lot of other hotels in town, certainly others downtown. Uh, about 15 to 20,000 square feet of retail space of some kind on the ground, ground level, and we'll show you some conceptual renderings here today. Uh, and then uh, some apartments. Uh, and those apartments right now, I believe, uh, initially it was proposed for about 45 apartments, between 40 and 45, and that's already been adjusted uh, because of space and market demand and so forth. Uh, we think there will most likely be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 apartments, most likely, when, when uh, this thing opens. Just on the public uh, parking system, just briefly to let you know where we are and kind of where we've been and again why why we're moving forward now the public parking system uh, right now today is a little over 90 percent full a little over 90 percent leased there are almost exactly 2400 spaces parking spaces in uh, four ramps 15 surface lots in the public system that does not include about a thousand meters on the street and in some of our surface lots so just what is leasable out of 2,400 spaces, a uh, little over 90% of those leases are, are occupied and uh, leases are paid for on a monthly basis. So that leaves us about 250 spaces right now going forward. Uh, and of course, we'll manage that very closely. We're still out there aggressively supporting new developments and bringing new folks to downtown. And we believe we can handle that. But we do need to get going with this project. And this project, as you'll see today, is going to be uh, really a two to three year effort between the public parking ramp and then finishing the private stuff. Okay, the project partners, and what we're really referring to today, we're very focused right now on the structure itself, the ramp, the hotel, the retail space, the apartments. So the principal partners today in that effort with the structure would be, uh, of course, starting with the city of Sioux Falls and those that we have brought on board to help support the effort. The Tegra Group I mentioned uh, in an owner's rep role. Uh, Fagri Baker Daniels, which is a law firm out of Minneapolis that we recently put under contract. They specialize in large mixed use projects, just like this one where you are combining private spaces with public spaces. And again, today and going forward, I think you're gonna get a flavor for really just how complex uh, that is and can be and will be and the better job you do on the front end, the less problems, less headaches, less legal issues you will have later on the back end. Uh, because with these projects, we're basically, we're getting married to these private partners in a structure that should be in place 50 to 75 years, potentially. And lots of things can happen and will happen over that time. And that has to all be anticipated and spelled out as much as possible when, when something happens and nobody wants to have happen or you know, what exactly is the remedy for that situation? So we try to anticipate all those things, and this firm will help us with that along with Tegra. They both have a great deal of experience in projects just like this in other parts of the, of the country. And then finally, Walker Parking Prof uh, Professionals or Consultants, which again, I know this group is very familiar with. Uh, they've been on board and helping us in a number of ways with the system uh, for several years and done a great job, and they'll continue to help us at a high level with this project. On the private side, uh, Bender Midwest Development, they'll build and operate the apartments. U.S. Hotel and Resort Management Incorporated, and they will build and operate the hotel space and operate the retail space, manage that as well. Um, you would know them as Ramcota companies locally, and they've got hotels with all kinds of different names, but they're basically the Ramcota uh, hotel folks. And then the last bullet point here, the MOU, uh, and that was uh, the reason for my email to you a couple weeks ago or within the last uh, 10 days or so, is uh, it's important to note that we do have a signed MOU in place, uh, basically stating that all of these parties, including the city, the public and private parties, are, are in agreement in general or in principle on those major project items that we'll have to agree on going forward. Um, this MOU will really be the foundation for the development agreement. That will be the much more detailed, legally binding document that we all sign and commit to in terms of what exactly each party will do, how we'll do it, who will pay for what. So that is something that we will be beginning now 
Uh, to give you a sense, the MOU is probably in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 pages, and that will be considered generic uh, by comparison to the development agreement. That'll be a very lengthy document, and so that's something that we'll focus on over the next uh, several months to get that completed. Okay, a few images to show you, uh, very similar compared to you know, what you've seen in the past uh, when we announced the project and began moving forward. So this is an image from the southeast looking northwest. Uh, so this would be 10th Street, basically. Uh, and on the ground level, what you see here is that's where the retail space would be on the ground level on your right-hand side to the east. On the ground level to the left or the west, that would likely be the hotel lobby. So that's what uh, the ground floor would consist of. Um, you see our First Avenue, just the upper corner of our First Avenue ramp uh, across the street there um, to the left. And then above the ground floor, that's where uh, uh, there would be some parking spaces actually behind the retail uh, space on the ground floor. And then uh, the second and third levels above ground are also parking. And then we'd have one level of underground parking that would be underneath everything. That would actually be the largest single level of parking that we, <coughs> that we have. And then above the parking would be um, the hotel, again, on the left or the west, and the apartments um, on the right or the east. So here's another image from a different uh, vantage point. This would be uh, from the southwest looking back northeast. Uh, and you see uh, Eastwald Smoke Shop. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Dustin. Right there. And then across the street, again, it's anticipated that would be the hotel lobby. And then in between there, that uh, what's oftentimes referred to as an alley, that's Mall Avenue. Uh, and that would remain in place. Uh, that's what we expect at this time. And that would be one of the major entrance and, and exit points. So a major access point for the ramp and also properties uh, behind it to the north. The next image here, this is on the back side or from the north looking uh, straight south. And wanted to show this. This is proposed as a rooftop patio. Uh, so again, very unique component in the mixed use project here. On the left hand side of the screen, that would be on the apartment side. So it's about mm, maybe a third, give or take, of the total rooftop patio space. That space would, uh, it's anticipated that would support the apartment. So that would essentially be a backyard for those residences. And then on the right hand side of the rooftop patio, about two thirds of the total space up there, that would be um, largely to support the hotel. So that would be uh, managed and maintained by the hotel. There would be some public access to that for events, but it would be utilized uh, you know, primarily for, for the hotel. Okay, at this time I'm going to introduce uh, Dick Strasberg and ask him to come up and talk about the design and construction aspects, including the CM at risk uh, resolution tonight. Dick? Well, good afternoon. So I'd like to walk you through uh, the process of hiring the architect and, and uh, determining the construction delivery method for a project like this. It's a little bit different than a typical project because we've got really three voices. We've got the voice of the of the hotel developer, voice of the apartment uh, developer, and then the city, and, uh, and then working in the retail as well. So what we, what we typically recommend on a, on a project like this is uh, engage an architect and engage a construction manager early on in the process, but have it as a, a limited role. So until the project actually completely unfolds, until we really can define what it is, understand the budget, understand the schedule, then we get into uh, you know, engagements that would carry it through the project completion. So initially, if we look at hiring the architect and uh, the engineering firm, uh, there's a group by the name of Perspectives, Inc. They are a local architectural firm. Uh, we were introduced to them by the developers who have both worked with them on several successful projects in the past. Uh, and uh, from a parking perspective, on the city's interest, uh, we've got Walker, and I was happy to see that the city already has a relationship with Walker. We've worked with them on virtually every project we've done, at least in the last 10 years, uh, on parking uh, ramps. We have two projects right now, one under construction that they designed and another one that's into the planning stage. 
Uh, so we're happy to see that. They're, they're, they're a good quality firm. And in this region, they're really the go-to firm on parking. They understand parking from uh, not just a, uh, you know, a construction and sort of a layout perspective, they understand it from an operational perspective. How many lanes do we need in? What's the stacking distances? And what's the operational system that will run the ramp? So uh, we're real happy that you've got uh, them involved. So on the, the architect, um, it's, it's very typical that we would take a, a limited scope. And what we would suggest as a first step uh, would be to, to engage the architect to start taking this concept. What you've seen uh, you know, on, the, on the sketches here, they're, they're conceptual sketches. And what needs to happen next is obviously, let's, let's vet it out. Let's figure out how many stalls we actually get. Uh, what are the shared services? What are the other th components of the, the project? How does the, the retail, how does the service side of the retail get, uh, how, how is that handled? The dock area, same with the hotel, all these things. These are the details we need to work out. And then the conclusion is that we, we get, uh, we need something that we can get priced up. So then it brings into the, uh, the equation the, the construction manager, and uh, how, do we, how do we get pricing early on? Because that's really what these projects need, because they take a lot of twists and turns as the numbers come in. So what we're recommending is construction manager uh, at risk delivery method. The primary advantage of it at this stage is having a pricing partner. They come in and they've got uh, current pricing of understanding, you know, should this be a post-tension ramp or should it be uh, precast? And, and these conditions change as markets uh, move and how you know how, how busy firms are and and so on so they can provide that pricing input up front additional member on the design side is Sayer associates on uh, looking at the site conditions so they'd be a partner as well in this initial stage so I'm open for questions on the CM at risk and um, and any other we've, we've worked with a lot some of you are very familiar with it others maybe not as much so thank you council councilman Rolfing yeah um, what are the other uh, options uh, instead of uh, construction manager at risk? The what most other options do we have? Yeah, the most popular would be is to do with the traditional design, bid, build in that order. So you design it, then you'd bid it out as hard bids, and then it would be uh, built by this, the low bidder. And in this case, it's still all, it's built by the low bidder. We look at the event center, for example, it, it was the low bids. I mean, it was, at the end of the day, you get the low, low bid. The advantage on it is you can go through under South Dakota state law, we can interview them and we can vet them out to see what's missing in their proposals and to, to see if they've got the staffing that's required to see really who the best fit is. Now, it, we've done this for the last, oh, I, I suppose, 20 years. In the upper Midwest, it's really, it's really taken off. It's kind of started off on the, on the uh, West Coast and it's kind of moved into this part of the country in a pretty big way. Uh, and, and primarily that, that uh, the difference between the traditional method and the construction manager at risk, they're a partner up front. They, we establish what they make. They bid on this thing up front. Their, their profit is, is established. So it's, it's, it's picked up front. The other would be a design build approach, um, which we would not recommend for a project of this complexity. It's, it's a very good delivery method. Same with a bid, um, bid hard bid uh, approach. It's a good uh, delivery method, but um, it's, it, we wouldn't recommend it for this complexity of, process, of project, especially when you got the different partners involved. Council Makarski. Couple questions. One of the mistakes that we've made in the past when we've done parking ramps is we haven't designed or engineered them to go up mm -hmm. to add additional levels. Mm -hmm. and I know right now this is looking like what a four story, five story building. Mm -hmm. Will it be designed or engineered to go up in the future? Uh, in this case, no. If we end up with a private partners uh, as development partners here, it would not because the, the roof would be, it would be you know, with the apartment and the uh, hotel above it. So it's not expandable going up. Because of the hotel? Yeah. Yep. We'd, we'd develop the layers below and the hotel you know, would sit on top of the ramp. Okay. Um, and then on the subject of the hotel, when I travel and I have a vehicle, when I have to park my vehicle at a downtown hotel, typically there's parking fees and we've got a parking ramp here. Are there gonna be uh, parking spots assigned to the hotel and will they be charging a different fee for parking than um, downtown retail parking would be? Or can you kind of 
walk me through how all that is it's expected to work? Segue for Darren. And <clears throat> if you guys don't mind, um, would you, could we just do the last slide with Dustin and then we'll get to the oh. question, so I'm sorry. And, and uh, Councillor, I'll answer that. That's a good question. I'll answer that and I'll address the previous one a little bit too. All right, so just uh, quickly what I kind of wanted to address with just some of the next steps that you're going to start to see from us going forward with this project. Um, some of these, most of these have already been uh, addressed with Dick and, and Darren's presentations, but uh, the, one of the big milestones that we'll have to do is the development agreement and negotiate through that. As Darren discussed, we have reached a signed agreement for an MOU that kind of outlines a lot of the things that will be addressed within the development agreement. Parking is one of those, and so Darren can talk on that a little bit. Um, Another step is finalizing the conceptual design. As Dick stated, we'd be bringing on perspective um, to do that conceptual design for us. Uh, our plan is to have a contract uh, for the conceptual design on the consent agenda for next Tuesday's meeting. Um, so you'll be seeing that coming forward. Issuing uh, the CMR or the, the construction manager at risk uh, RFP. Um, so that's what we have on the agenda tonight is a request, a resolution requesting authorization to use that approach. And, and Dick has gone through that and we'll be here again uh, and now to answer any questions or later tonight to answer any questions regarding that. Defining the project budget is another uh, milestone that we'll have to achieve and a lot of that will come once we start to get into the process. As Dick talked about, it's very typical to start to get into the design process before you get to um, hard numbers within the budget. So we'll continue to work towards that as we move forward. And then uh, quarterly updates, as Darren uh, suggested, that we'll continue to come in front of you uh, to do these updates and bring you more information. So next, uh, our next planned meeting would be in January, and we'll be through many of these items uh, at that point in which we'll be able to update you further. So at this time, I'll uh, bring Darren back up to address uh, Mr. Karski's question, and then we'll be here to answer any other questions as well. Yeah, two questions there. Um, one on the parking fees for the hotel uh, and also for the apartment residents. The short answer is yes. There will be uh, a system of some kind in place like you've experienced in, in other cities and, and uh, I know I have as well. And each of them look a little different, but at the same time kind of the same concept. And so that is part of what we will begin to flesh out. Uh, Walker parking professionals, again, one of the reasons we have them on board is not only for the design side of this and construction, but also to put them under contract to help us determine all those things. How do we do this? Because uh, the reality is this one, very likely the model will be uh, a little different than the other ramps we have because those are just kind of straightforward standalone ramps without any of these other things on site. Uh, this one's very different and will be a little more complex that way. So we'll have to figure those things out. We have had, you know, discussions with the private partners. I think they understand that. Uh, well, I know they understand that. We've had those discussions. And then in the development agreement is where we will really flesh all of that out and get very specific with how it would function and how much those things would be. Uh, the second question, well, the first question I'll answer second. The adding on, uh, yeah, there's no question. If we were building, uh, again, you know, if we were just doing another straightforward parking ramp, we absolutely would build it in, in such a way that we could add on to it. Um, you know, this is, there's always trade-offs with projects, and uh, that would be one of the trade-offs with this project is getting the private partners or private uses, particularly the rooftop patio, um, that I think a lot of people are excited about downtown. Um, you know, one of the trade-offs is likely an inability to, to expand. Now, having said that, you know, we still anticipate, even though it's hidden, and that's kind of the whole point, what you're looking at here is essentially 600 parking spaces. Um, you know, so that would be most likely the largest parking ramp we have when we're done. So it holds a lot of cars. And even if it were a standalone ramp, I don't think we would build more than 600 spaces today. Uh, and if we did and we could add on, you know, most likely it would be the ability to add on would probably be two levels and less than 200 cars. And, and when I say add on, I'm not talking specifically probably about parking, but even adding on another, you know, story or two yeah. for the hotel or office yep. or habitational above it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's when I say add on, I'm talking about 
the ability to add on that way. Oh, okay. I think in, in this next phase, that's exactly the kind of issues we work through. Work through the issue of, of uh, you know, what are the fire codes, it's the building codes, what do we have to do when we start going up and try and, and determine that. Just one other note too on, on uh, if, if in terms of adding on to uh, parking ramps, which is, is, is commonly done. It's, you know, that's if they're designed that way. One of the challenges that we see though is, um, is how you design the, the exiting because it's, it's really a challenge, you get big ramps. They take a long time to unload. And I've spent enough time here in Sioux Falls to know that people aren't gonna be very patient to wait to get out of a ramp. So I think you know, controlling that and understanding that up front, I think is, is pretty important. Good point, and I have just one more question regarding the construction manager at risk. And when we did the event center, we also had an owner's rep. And do they go hand in hand, or why would we do one without the other? Well, the owner's rep, I can speak on behalf of, of doing that um, in the role that I have. And, and I came from a background where I also was on the construction side. They're completely different roles. The role of an owner's rep is to is really an extension of the staff, and it is a uh, it is representing the city's interests on all fronts. And a construction manager is they are the ones that are managing the subcontractors, taking the bids, knowing the local, uh, you know, ins and outs of the of the construction. They're the builders, and they think like builders. We want them to think like builders. They don't think like owners. And an owner's rep, you know, we need to think like an owner and be, be thinking through all the, helping make the decisions that, you know, will cause this to be a long-term asset for the city. Does that answer it? I just that, thank you. Okay, Councilor Erfenbach. Thank you. A um, couple questions for Darren, if I could. Um, first, talking about that idea of eventually needing more parking downtown. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my brain goes to it's not going to be in that location. We're putting in a huge ramp here, and yeah. it's right next to our biggest or one of our bigger ramps now. Yep. Will it not? I mean, when we expand parking downtown, won't it be somewhere else? Well, I, you know, at this point in time, I would make the same, I would bet on the same assumption and project that it would likely be somewhere else if we built a ramp and added significant parking. However, uh, I would also say this, there are some folks I know early on, even with this project, who had you know, some feedback was, we, we have a large parking ramp across the street. And so the truth is, with the parking system being an enterprise fund, which you folks know means we're entirely self-supported. There are no subsidies of any kind. It has to be self-supported. It's essentially run like a business inside city government. We will acquire parking assets and build those to add inventory where there's market demand. And right now, in the last several years, the strong market demand by far has been in the core. Um, First Avenue parking ramp across the street is 100% full, and I think even a little over 100% full. We can overfill uh, them uh, slightly. The uh, Block 11 ramp, which is kitty corner from here, and the other closest ramp is also over 100% full. Um, so this is where the strong demand has been and continues to be. Now, I would like to think as downtown grows, diversifies in terms of development and all kinds of other things, um, you know, the next parking ramp could be on the East Bank, the way the East Bank is developing, and we'll see what happens with the rail yard redevelopment. That's a game changer. Uh, uptown, there's a lot of things taking place in Uptown over the last uh, three, four years that really weren't taking place before. There could be a need for something there. Uh, so it's impossible to predict with 100% certainty um, but most likely I would think it would be somewhere other than this immediate area. I guess that's what I was thinking too, is that, you know, um, Main Avenue is changing and, and like mm -hmm. you said, uptown. And so our traffic patterns are going to change. We don't know what they are, right. but it just seems like that next ramp, which you know, we're going to build yes. that next ramp is going to be a little farther away from right at that intersection where we're putting all this parking right now. That's Second right. question then, if I can go back to that slide that shows the roof patio from the north side. Yeah. I am just, and I'm not looking at the patio, although I love it, I, I can't wait to, to go there, but look at that gray area down on the ground before then, and I see Mr. Baker is here, and I'm just wondering where is the parking going for that building that sits over there that has the bank and all of that? What's, what's happening there? Mm -hmm. And I realize it's just grayed out, but help me visualize that. Well, uh, yes, First National Bank, uh, I think virtually all the meetings we've had on this project have actually involved them. Uh, they were part of 
the proposal initially with the private folks, uh, but a part of the proposal that was not selected to move forward uh, for a number of reasons, legal and otherwise. Um, but of course, they and I would also identify the River Center building, which is just across, uh, well, not across the street, but across the parking lot to the east. Those are both what I would consider significant adjacent partners in this project, even though they're not partners in the structure, per se. Um, uh, this uh, <coughs> structure, as you see it, fits entirely and exclusively today on the city-owned surface lot. Uh, that gray you see is actually not gray in reality. It's a surface lot that First National Bank owns. Actually, Mall Avenue runs there, and that may or may not be vacated as part of this. They will still have their surface lot, and then they have folks, uh, quite a few of them, that park throughout our public parking system, but nearby. Okay. So we would work closely with them you know, to accommodate their needs, just like we would the River Center, who has a number of people parking in the surface lot today. Uh, and any of the other key customers that we have in the system. That makes more sense to me then. Some mm -hmm. of those folks that are on that surface lot now will be in the ramp and then that, I just, I'm, this looks enormous in a space yeah. that just, when I walk across that parking lot, it right. does not look that big, that's I swear. That's right. So that was what was throwing me, so I appreciate that, yep. thank you. Councilman Jamison. Thank you, uh, you may have said it. Could you just remind me how many parking spots, public parking spots were there? There are approximately 125 today so, uh, one the, on the surface lot. I'm sorry, <coughs> that you're proposing with this project? Right now it's approximately 600. Okay, and then a couple of questions if I could. The uh, construction manager at risk, the uh, potential issues there are that uh, maybe just assure me a couple of things. Mm -hmm. The number of the number of, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. whoever would, uh, I guess the question maybe is how many local contractors are qualified to be a contract manager at risk? I think we've got several very good in this market. Yeah, we've like, got, I, I think, at least three. Does that create any problem, having only three, or should there be more, just as far as a competitive nature? Does that, uh, do you see that as an issue or not? Well, we can tell you in the private sector when we go out and we um, are asking people to propose and we are picking the number, we pick three. And the reason for that is when you get four, five, you get more. Um, it, it, it costs a lot for a, a contractor to go after a job. And what we want is we want them to absolutely go after it and put, their, put everything they've got into it. And this is a very attractive project, so it, it could be that we get you know additional contractors as well. I'm just personally familiar with three. Uh, but I think three, I think you're in good shape if you get three. Okay, and then the other concern is, at least that I'm uh, kind of picking up on and maybe sensing is, would there be a breakdown of the cost on what the private investors are spending and what we are spending on just the parking? Every so penny of it. There yeah. would be. There would be. We're doing one right now in Duluth, for example. That happened to be a 500 car parking ramp and it's got retail retail actually on two levels because it's Duluth. You know, we've got skyways and you've got hills and got a lot to work with there. But in that case, we've got two levels of, of retail. And then it's, in that case, an office development above. And every penny is accounted for. Okay. And it's, it's um, almost militantly, it has to be. So, yes. Maybe a question for Darren. The, the idea that uh, uh, I've certainly have been in uh, other places where we've, I've stayed in uh, hotels attached to parking ramps like this and uh, paid the $50 a day for parking craziness, you know. Yeah. But the, uh, the idea that we're used to these parking ramps all standing alone, this concept is great. I mean, it just yep. is so great compared to what we've done in the past. But the question, I guess, is, is the benefit to us, uh, the city, the aesthetics? Uh, do we, how else do we benefit yeah. from having this mixed use? No, I mean, that's a great question, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head. The reality is it would have been much more simple to go forward, you know, with a straightforward ramp, but you do see them in other cities for lots of good reasons, and I think we're ready for that. Some of the immediate benefits I would see off the top of my head, first of all, would be, you know, increasing the tax base. These will be private 
the hotel and apartments and the retail space will be considered private spaces and they'll, you know, they'll pay property taxes. So you're, you're looking at a project that, you know, if it's in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 million total, now that includes ours, uh, either way, you're talking about a multi-million dollar private investment and considerable increase in the, in the property tax base. I also think as we, you know, continue to grow as a city, especially downtown, but throughout the community, you know, we want to be as efficient as possible from a planning perspective with the property, the land that we have. Um, so very efficient, and I believe that's also what Shape Places is all about, even at a, a community-wide level. So very efficient use of the land, bringing uh, potentially new uses to downtown, um, more of some of the same uses, whatever the market will support. And then also, I guess the last thing I would touch on immediately is, you know, purely from a public parking perspective, what I also like about it is when you build a new ramp and open it, there is risk, you know, it's a bit of a build it and they will come. And I know I was uh, almost, well, brand new council member years ago when, when the city opened 8th and Dakota ramp and that was absolutely a build it and they will come. And uh, it took a while uh, before they came. And, and there's been a lot of years, more years than not, that that ramp has struggled and been more than half empty. Um, it's doing well and nearly full now. Um, with this, with the private uses on site, and we know ahead of time they're going to agree to use the ramp, we really have the benefit of hitting the sweet spot of, of adding significant inventory to downtown to support new development but also getting built-in customers on day one that can financially support the ramp. And that's what we've been after all along. If we could hit the sweet spot timing-wise and financially with the ramp, and that is really hard to do, and we haven't done it yet, but I think we're on track to do that. Thank you. Councilor Erickson. Um, I don't know if I have any questions. Maybe one verification about the apartments first. Remind me, are they market rate? Yes. They are, okay. Yep. So here's, here's what I, I guess, I just wanna make a statement um, with having sat on this and we had three proposals that came in, mm -hmm. all three fantastic, very, very different proposals mm -hmm. that came in and there are aspects of each one that each of us on, on the RFP were saying, oh, we really like that. Do you think they'll still do that? And so I know that we mm -hmm. expressed as members to say, hey, let's still go back to number two and three that, that maybe weren't selected to, to see if we can yep. enhance other areas because each place put, each proposal put it in a different space. This one um, clearly won unanimously from um, the group just based on many different reasons and um, you know, there's a lot of benefits to having the parking hid. It's very aesthetically mm -hmm. pleasing with having it hid kind of in the backside. Also having the market rate apartments as well. You know, we, have, we hear, we kind of had a side conversation about some of the condos downtown. And what I like is that the market rate apartments allow for maybe some of the younger, yeah. um, out of college, maybe small families, maybe big families, I don't know. But to be able to live in these market rate apartments, to be able to work, live and play and have a different feel like maybe some of the other big cities um, and just some some like that and, and um, it just offers a different type of living atmosphere in the downtown the other thing that I liked about this project is it's close to the triangle mm -hmm. that little tiny gold piece of land that's just behind there and that will probably be developed in mm -hmm. some amount of time to be able to complement this development as well so there's lots of pieces to this um, the only other question I guess I had as I was looking at this is um, the street vacate has there been any other additional conversation because I know that was a big piece of the proposal but at the same time there was definitely concern with Heath oh yeah and engineering and relocating and doing stuff um, just curious about the street vacation with that and what it could do to traffic downtown. Yes, yeah, so um, the street vacation that she's referring to is actually just east of here behind River Center. It's uh, River, River Road, which then turns and goes west, turns into 9th Street when it goes west. In this initial proposal, uh, there was a portion that included the First National Bank uh, surface lot as well as that triangle uh, that was also referred to. Uh, and that portion of the proposal uh, was not, could not, and was not selected to move forward with this. Uh, that 
piece of property will have its day uh, soon. I think we're going to be in position to issue an RFP most likely this month. It's a very valuable piece of property, by the way. The parking system owns it. Um, so we're excited about that too. But that that street will not be uh, will will not be vacated as part of this. You know, now what happens with that triangle and those proposals, we'll see. But the traffic engineering folks, including Heath Hopteaser, have made it pretty clear that's a, that is a critical street. Uh, they surprised us a little bit and shared that that street carries, uh, believe it or not, it carries about 4,000 cars in a 24-hour period, which is very comparable to Phillips Avenue, which I think was a bit of a surprise. So that is critical. Now, could it be altered a little bit like Main Avenue, made more pedestrian friendly and have some unique features? Yes, it can, and they're uh, supportive of considering that, and I think that might be something really neat too in terms of how this whole area could change, you know, with this, so. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilman Karski? Just a quick question. Um, we're gonna be bonding for this and paying for it, like you said, as enterprise dollars yep. from our parking. So it's not gonna be using any tax dollars to pay for this or obligating that. That's right. But it will tie up our enterprise fund from the parking services for, I'd imagine, several years. What does that do to us as far as looking forward if we do have to add another parking ramp in mm -hmm. the future? Well, it's that's again a great question and it's definitely one that we've been focused on for some time and we continue to be focused on. That will be a significant part of, we are in the process right now of determining all of that financing. It's also gonna tie in, we're going to be back here later this month and Matt Nelson is here today talking to you about uh, the parking rates and uh, uh, our recommendation with Walker Parking Professionals to adjust those rates going forward. That's all part of the package of how do we take this step, which we need to, to support downtown, but also make sure we have one eye towards the future of when do we anticipate the next ramp could be needed and how would we finance that and take on, uh, have, uh, additional debt service um, uh, combined with this one and how would we be able to afford that so those are all the things that we'll try and put ourselves in position to be able to do and it it all ties in from the rates to the business model of this ramp including the hotel and apartments and what they pay and so forth that's all part of that package and making sure we're in position in say 10 years to build another ramp and take on additional debt if that's what we need and decide to do. So you, what short answer is you're still looking at it and you haven't yep. made that determination yes. about need and payoff and that's right. the, the commitment that we're yep. making. And we'll make the best decision we possibly can to put the system in the best possible position whenever that day comes. You know, back in 07, before the recession, uh, there was uh, there was thought that, hey, we're gonna need to build a ramp <clears throat> soon, maybe now. And if they would have, it would have been a big mistake for the system and you really can't blame them. They were looking at numbers and trends. The bottom fell out of the economy, parking demand plummeted, some businesses, major businesses, at least one, you know, left downtown, another one left the public parking system. So it's incredibly difficult to predict and you just make the best decisions you can you know, looking ahead, and that's what we'll try and do. And we've got good people involved, our finance staff, bond council, bond council has a financial advisor, so they'll all help us with that. Thank you. Councilman Jamison. Uh, Darren, the uh, Councilor Urpenbach brought up a question about the size of the building and the look, mm -hmm. and uh, got me looking on my map, and we were discussing it here. <clears throat> do you have an overview map of just this because it seems like this building is bigger than the surface lot. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. I just want to make sure I have it understood completely. It's, yep. it's just our lot. Yeah, it is just our lot. Uh, the, only, uh, the only thing I'm going to hedge on right now is, if, and this came from the architect, uh, the only thing I'm going to hedge on is if this utilizes Mall Avenue behind it to the north, I'm pretty confident in saying it does not even though we have talked about potentially vacating Mall Avenue back there, whether we need it to grow the structure or for other reasons. But no, it, uh, it is to scale. 
Uh, you don't want me drawing stuff uh, to scale, believe me. But this came from the architects, and I'm told it fits on our site, so. Very good. <clears throat> Any other questions from the council? Darren, I've got a few. Sure. Um, what's the estimated uh, project cost for this project? Yeah, uh, well, on the last slide, the nec uh, next steps, the second to last bullet point says define uh, project budget. That really is, um, Dick can talk at a significantly higher level about CM at risk and the delivery methods than I can, although I'm very familiar with those, having worked for the contractors for a few years myself. But I would tell you from a public parking system and an owner perspective, what I'm interested in most about CM at risk initially is getting a contractor involved, working closely with the architect so we don't get designs and plans and then it goes out to bid and you got surprises in the market. Uh, so that's a real key attribute as far as I'm concerned with CM at risk and starting that process as soon as possible is determining what exactly that project budget is, is going to be. You know, I can tell you what we speculate and estimate on the ramp and the private you know, it's a dangerous thing to do, but we've said all along we anticipate this ramp being in the neighborhood of, you know, 10 to 12 million. It could go north of there. It depends on, uh, you know, how those, how the bidding process looks and, and uh, where the market is. So we're building a 600 space, three level ramp. Is that what's planned at this yeah, point? Yeah, it's actually four levels. It's three above ground and then the one level underground. So it'd be four levels of parking. Uh, and keep in mind that retail space is in front of parking. A, a small percent of the ground level is for the retail space. Everything behind there, I'm gonna swing around to the backside. Yep, see how on the ground level you see those cars? Most of the ground level will be for parking, but it will be hidden by the retail space in front of it on 10th Street, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, Will we be using TIF for this project? Will we normally do for everything <laughs> downtown? Uh, well, it, it is a distinct possibility, yes. And that is, uh, TIF is part of the financing process. And so, again, what we're focused on right now is what does that project budget look like? What are the, the, the sources and uses of funds and so forth? And yeah, TIF absolutely is gonna be on the table. Okay. So there will be public dollars used on this project. <clears throat> if we're gonna use TIF, that's, pro that's public dollars. If a TIF is needed, requested, and approved, then yes, the property taxes paid as a result of this project could go back in. Um, but that's a big if right now. That obviously, like any project anywhere, if we determine it doesn't need a TIF to move forward. We don't support TIF. Um, but that is one of the things we're looking at and, uh, and it's a possibility. And a lot of uh, other projects downtown, uh, there's other ways of uh, financing the, the facade program. And I think we have a downtown tax abatement oh, yeah. that can be utilized to those will all be looked at also, correct? Everything will be looked at, um, you know, and there's actually, there's actually, we don't probably do a good enough job of stating this. There's actually quite a few projects downtown, a long list that don't, you know, receive TIF and move forward. Um, but of course, the ones that get the most attention and are high profile, you know, are the ones that come in front of you for, for uh, a TIF request and approval. Um, but yeah, the bigger projects tend to, to need TIF downtown. It's not exclusively true, but it is oftentimes, and this one could. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the council? Just wanted to, okay. Mr. I Chair. I need a motion, please. Um, I would Rolfe. move that we um, move into executive session to consult with legal counsel about uh, proposed or pending litigation or contractual matters pursuant to South Dakota codified law 1-25-23. Second. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this meeting will be uh, ended after the executive session, and we will start the fiscal committee meeting after that, too. Thank you.